2023 was an interesting year for film. We began to see the first real signs of superhero fatigue. Other major franchises weren't quite as successful as they had been. There seemed to be a greater push from general audiences for better quality movies and this led to a lot of box office disappointments. But that said, it was also a great year for films with some really well made high quality movies compared with the years before. And so in today's video, I'm going to rank all the movies that I saw in 2023 from my least favourite to my favourite. Hello and welcome to Cinemates and if you're new here be sure to subscribe for more videos like this over the coming year. As always I need to set out my criteria for what I'm going to include in this ranking. Now I'm not going to be including every movie that I saw else this video would be a lot longer and I want to keep it quite focused and so I'm going to include the types of movies that I mainly talk about on this channel. So yes superhero movies but also big franchises kind of action heavy large budget movies. So some movies that came out last year that fall outside of this I'm not going to include on this ranking and I missed a lot of movies movies in 2023 so this really is not a conclusive definitive list this is just me talking about what I did manage to see and so I've narrowed this list down to a nice round 10 of the worst and the best big movies of the last year so starting with number 10 Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania well where do I even start with this film because it's not awful it's what I'd call superficially entertaining but there's no substance here it loses the charm the wit and the fresh small scale nature of the previous Ant-Man movies and it trades it all to instead feel like the next generic step in the MCU and I'm not actually against Ant-Man becoming a more important figure he's been around for almost 10 years now he's been in Civil War and he was very important in Endgame so I think the character has earned having a more significant third movie but this is just not the way to do it and it's especially not the way to introduce the next big bad guy because Kang was probably the most interesting thing about this film but when you see the new major threat of the multiverse get beaten by a couple of ant people and some actual ants it really diminishes the threat that this character poses. While the villain might have been intimidating in his scenes, he's no longer intimidating when he can get beaten so easily. And so that makes this movie fail as both an Ant-Man movie and as a setup for Kang. This movie feels like it has no stakes, it all takes place in a pocket dimension, so the real world can't be impacted. Despite us being told that there's massive stakes here, it doesn't ever feel like it, with no threat or death or any kind of personal impact for our characters. Most of the third MCU entries have higher stakes than the last, with major character-defining deaths or major character-defining decisions. But here there is nothing in the movie. It just kind of ends like that adventure never even happened. Kang seemingly gets defeated and it feels like they chickened out of a more effective ending for Kang, escaping the quantum realm and Ant-Man and the Wasp getting stuck there. Because it feels like that's what the ending should have been and I think that would have worked far more effectively. And it feels like that was the plan but it got changed in the editing room. And that's not even talking about how this has some of the worst jokes in the MCU and definitely some of the worst CGI. Number 9 Shazam Fury of the Gods. Next up we have another superhero movie movie, the sequel to the first Shazam film, which was one of my favourite DCEU films. That first one was a real fun breath of fresh air with a unique premise and a surprising amount of heart. But the second time around, a lot of that is lost. Zachary Levi is still great fun in the lead role and I like that this delves deeper into the lore of the gods and the wizards and I like that this feels like a proper sequel, carrying over plot points and items from the last film into this one. In wider cinematic universes, it often feels like we lose true sequels to instead tell the next step of the story of the wider universe but this one feels like a classic proper sequel, but unfortunately not a good one. It feels like it struggles to know how to use all of the Shazam family and how to deal with so many characters. While the youthful energy of Zachary Levi is still fun, it feels even more disconnected from his child form, who is now a lot older and feels way more mature than his superhero self. And it really lost a lot of the heart that made the first movie so special. And it feels like it trades all of that for a generic superhero fighting a dragon and making jokes. And it has some of the worst product placement of the year with a really forced Skittles advertisement. Number eight, The Marvels. And this continues our streak of superhero movies with The Marvels, which to me was a pretty fun, fast paced, inoffensive entry to the MCU, which does absolutely nothing special or to stand out, but also nothing awful. Back in the highs of Marvel's phase two and three, it felt like every movie was delivering on a unique premise, an interesting take on the superhero genre that we hadn't seen before. Influenced by movies outside of the superhero genre. We had high school movies, we had heist movies, we had political thrillers, but recently it kind of feels like we've lost that and a lot of MCU entries just feel pretty generic. They aren't giving us something unique and they aren't the best at what they do. And honestly, I'm not quite sure what the Marvels is trying to be. It's a team up movie, but it's not the best MCU film to do that. It's a quest across multiple planets in the galaxy, but it's not the best one to do that. It's got absurd
absurdist humor, but it's not the best one to do that. And so it just ends up feeling forgettable. I've never disliked Brie Larson in the role, but I feel like they haven't known what to do with her. And that continues here with her characterization drastically changing between scenes. They just don't know who this character is. And it's frustrating because after the backlash of the first Captain Marvel film, they needed this one to be really solid, but unfortunately it's not. And there's just no excuse. I think Monica Rambo is a fun addition. I loved her in WandaVision, but again, they didn't quite know how to use her character. And Ms. Marvel is fantastic. She is the best thing about this film. She brings so much natural energy here that makes her fun to watch, but she's not enough to save the film. I genuinely think we have the worst Marvel movie villain here with Dar Ben. While we've had generic and forgettable villains before, usually the villain is with the script, not the performance. However, this time it's the other way around. I think on paper, there was something interesting in this character, having this past connection to Captain Marvel, trying to fix the mistakes that the lead character made, but it was all lost in the performance with this boring, emotionless character who doesn't blink and so it just loses any realism or connection that we can have to this character who should be relatively sympathetic. I think it's one of the biggest miscasts in the MCU. She just feels like a stand-in for Ronan the Accuser and while Ronan was also not the best villain not by any means but at least he was memorable. My thoughts here are pretty all over the place because that's what this movie feels like. There is some good here and there is some bad. It's fun, it's short, it's fast-paced, all things that I like but it's messy, it's inconsequential, it's trying to do a lot of things but it doesn't do any of them really well. Overall, just another movie that added to the superhero fatigue and an increasing list of problems with the current MCU films. Number seven, The Flash. Continuing our streak of superhero movies low down my list is The Flash, a movie which I had really little interest in due to the handling of the Ezra Miller controversy. However, this movie did actually surprise me and I ended up liking it a lot more than I expected. It has major fundamental issues, but overall I found myself connecting to the main emotional story that The Flash is on and that was enough for this movie to work for me overall. So yes, the film is messy, it feels long, it offensively resurrects actors from the dead, a lot of the time travel stuff just doesn't really make sense, it just has the worst superhero CGI ever, and the overall message of the movie is messy, with no real consequence for our main character messing with time, and he even gains from it. But ultimately, I did find myself connecting with The Flash's journey. I buy into his relationship with his parents, and I understand why he would want to go back in time to try and change it. And then he has to undo that at the end, and it's emotional and it works. Up until this point, I never liked Ezra Miller's version of The Flash, but after seeing this movie, I kind of got why they cast Ezra Miller, and I think it smartly paired The Flash with a more annoying version of The Flash so that we can see how far this character has come. You add on top of that an adaptation of a very strong comic book storyline, and you bring back Michael Keaton's Batman, it had just enough flavour here to make it work more than it doesn't. Number 6, Dungeons and Dragons, Honour Among Thieves. Now, the list from this point up are movies that I thought were actually really good. I feel like this year there were a lot of movies that were bad, and a lot of movies that were great, and less of the in-between middle movies. And so we have a massive gap in quality from The Flash to this. And at number six is Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves, which I thought was great. A movie that I went into with basically no expectations and very little connection with, and I found myself really enjoying it. I think it smartly takes a very fun and light tone rather than letting us get bogged down in the years of history for this franchise. It focuses on being accessible and light and on the characters, which in turn then makes us interested in the world. Instead of throwing all the information at me, it makes me want to learn more about about it after seeing the film. And so it succeeds at its goal. It's got very fun characters with very charming actors in the roles. It has some very creative sequences. It had some good action. And overall, I think it's exactly what it needed to be to introduce general audiences to the world of D&D. Number five, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Next up, we have the latest addition to the TMNT franchise. And I thought this movie was fantastic. And it went a bit under the radar. This is my most underrated movie of the year. It was fun, it was fresh, and it had fantastic, unique animation. It really put the teenage in teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with a fun, youthful cast and it modernised the turtles while still keeping them true to their core. It used animation to not only reference their comic book origins but to give us fluid animated action. Alongside the youthful tone and the great animation was an emotional heart which helps to elevate this movie from being just another Ninja Turtle film. Sure, it takes some liberties from the source material, changing some things and modernising others but I feel like it gets what makes these characters work. This really made me love the Ninja Turtles again and it made me realise why these characters and their dynamics are so good and I really hope that we get more from this version. If you missed it in theatres be sure to check it out so that we can get more films like this. Number four John Wick chapter four. Coming into these top four are movies that I think are really really good. These are the best movies of 2023 and I think in any other year they could have been my favourite for that year but for 2023 the great movies were so competitive that there were a lot competing for that top spot and so at number four is John Wick 4. The John Wick franchise has consistently been great with each entry outdoing the last with its practical work and stunt 
stylized world. I think the John Wick 2 and 3 struggled a bit to create a story as engaging as the first movie and at times felt a bit bogged down by the complex world and lore. But I think 4 ties it all together really well, giving us the best story since the first, giving us the best side characters out of all of them and hands down giving us the best action in the franchise. This is what completely elevates this movie beyond the other John Wick sequels because it's not just that the action is extremely practical and well choreographed like the other John Wick movies. What blew me away is that every action scene felt like the biggest action scene they have ever done. Each action set piece felt like it could have been the big third act action scene where normally the biggest set piece is say for the last but here we have like four of them throughout the whole movie. We have this massive opening in Osaka, we have the scene in the traffic, there's the top down sequence or the fight of stairs at the Sacre Coeur and then smartly the film actually ends with a smaller more personal fight. So each sequence felt like it could be the showstopper and overall it just consistently blew me away at how well it was able to deliver on so many practical large scale action sequences consistently. Number three, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Kicking off our top three is Across the Spider-Verse, another movie that just completely blew me away but for different reasons. Firstly, I owe this movie a lot. It was on the build up and the release of this movie that my channel really started to take off and so I think this movie creating interest in Spider-Man this year helped people to find my videos and so I'm really grateful for this movie for that and it will always be important to me. But even without that, this movie is phenomenal in its own right. Into the Spider-Verse was a groundbreaking movie for animation and it felt so fresh and new and so there were a lot of questions about whether that could be repeated in the sequel and they absolutely could. Where the first movie created this comic book hand-drawn frame rate changing style, the sequel pushes it to the next level, really playing around with different styles giving each character and universe their own look and even using animation to display emotion like the scene between Gwen and her dad. They managed to create another emotional story through the journeys that Gwen and Miles are on while still having the fun and humour that made the first movie so special. It's clearly made with a lot of love for Spider-Man with loads of references and a clear understanding of what makes Spider-Man characters work. Overall a fantastic sequel and another revolutionary film for animation. The only thing that really holds it back is that cliffhanger ending. Sure Gwen has a complete arc here but Miles really doesn't and it's very much one half of the story. That's going to bother some people in different ways. Some people aren't going to mind. The people behind me in the cinema were really annoyed by it. I went into this film knowing it was a part one so it didn't bother me too much but I don't think I can have it at number one on my list when I haven't seen how all of the story unfolds. A weaker part two could really damage this movie and I haven't seen the emotional payoff to a lot of the arc set up. So overall a brilliant part one but I really need to see part two to know how it ends and I hope they can pull it off. Number two, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. At number two is another two-parter with Dead Reckoning Part 1, but I think in this case it handles the Part 1 better than Spider-Verse, because on its own it's more of a complete story, with Ethan Hunt succeeding in his mission to get an object while still leaving room for Part 2 with some of the character arcs and what happens next. Coming into this movie, I did not think it would be able to top John Wick 4 as the best action movie of the year, because John Wick had so many fantastic set pieces paced throughout the movie but Dead Reckoning does that as well. This movie is essentially just three massive set pieces tied together by a compelling story because much like John Wick it is dedicated to delivering massive practical action set pieces. Sure it doesn't have quite the same style as the John Wick movies but instead it feels more realistic and grounded. What I love about that action here is that not only are they realistic and practical but they often add in an extra thing to spice them up to make them interesting because these action scenes are really long and so once the action team has used up its initial premise they add in something extra. Extra. We have this hunt in an airport but then there's a bomb. We have a car chase in Rome but then our two protagonists are handcuffed together making it harder. Ethan Hunt needs to intercept the train but first he needs to parachute onto it and then once he does the train gets derailed making it even harder. So they know exactly what to add in here to keep the action fresh. What I also like here is that they seem to take more from the past Mission Impossible movies. Bringing back characters from Mission Impossible 1 and the cinematography that links back to the first film. It adds in some of the humour from Mission Impossible 4 and the grounded fast paced action sequences of the recent film. So really I think it just has the same mind blowing action set pieces that John Wick 4 has but with some extra elements in here that made me prefer it. I also think it's paced a little better, both movies are very long but I think Dead Reckoning moved quicker and most importantly it brings back something that was missing from the last Mission Impossible movie that was in almost all the other ones and that's sticking Tom Cruise in a stupid pair of glasses or goggles 
and I'm so glad we got that again. Number one, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. But coming in as my favorite film of the year on this list is Guardians 3. That unlike my number three and two spot, which are two partners, this one acts as a very definitive conclusion. And I found the conclusion so satisfying and so surprising. I absolutely loved the first Guardians movie and I was a bit disappointed with the second one. And so I was really hoping that this one would be able to capture more of the heart and the emotion that underpins the first movie. It's been a wild ride since that first Guardians film. The year that first film came out, we had Andrew Garfield still playing Spider-Man. And in the time between Guardians 2 and 3, we had a whole Spider-Man trilogy with a completely different actor. That just shows how much the landscape has changed in the almost 10 years between Guardians 1 and 3. There was also a lot of behind the scenes troubles with James Gunn being fired from this movie to then being rehired and in the meantime making a Suicide Squad movie and being hired as the head of DC. So there's a significant amount of time, history and emotion that went into the making of this movie. And you can tell that because it feels so different from the rest of the MCU right now. This has a clear vision, clear character arcs and clear messages that the director wants to tell. Despite being set in space, it feels real with practical sets and not an overuse of CGI. The Guardians 3 brings it back to more of the tone of that first film, where there is a sad emotional story behind one of our lead characters, but there's a sense of joy and heart and family through our team and their dynamic. This has the best action in the Guardians trilogy. You can see how far Gunn has come as a filmmaker with the standout being that hallway scene and while still not the strongest villain in the MCU it definitely has the strongest villain in the trilogy. I know a lot of people were disappointed that no one died in this film and said that there were a lack of stakes but I disagree. People don't have to die to have stakes. If the action and the situation feel real you can create a sense of danger even without killing off characters and that's something that this movie does well and there's a sense of stakes for the team for the characters. It's not just about whether someone lives or dies there are stakes for the team as a whole and by the end of the movie this team's splits up and so it does feel like there are stakes here just not in the usual way. I think Civil War is another MCU movie that does this well and I love that this movie gave us an ending for the Guardians that felt unexpected. A lot of us went into this movie thinking a character would die. It would have made sense for Rocket to die with this being such a personal story for him. You could see Star-Lord dying, sacrificing himself to save his new family. The same goes for Nebula or Drax, especially as an actor who has been quite outspoken against Disney. And so it really felt like someone would die here, but no one did and I love that because it gave us an ending that was unexpected, that was satisfying and it didn't have to kill off our characters because it's so obvious now. To see Rocket's arc through Guardians 2 and Infinity War and Endgame of him becoming a leader, being in our face the whole time we just didn't see it. I thought him rejecting himself as a raccoon was just a silly joke but it became a powerful moment of self-acceptance. There's always been criticism around us not seeing Drax being enough of a destroyer and him being too silly but now we learn that the destroyer was just a phase of his life. Just a few years where he was on a path for vengeance but once that has gone, once we see the true Drax the destroyer, he's a dad and that's something we've always known about him from the start. We always knew he had a daughter and through his new family, through Mantis and the children he meets in this film, he can now accept himself as a dad and he allows himself to dance. The arcs here are so good and so satisfying it feels really well planned out and that's something that the MCU has lost recently. Sure I have a few criticisms like Adam Warlock feels a bit forced in here and there were a few too many death fake outs but overall these are really minor criticisms when you think about what works for this film. So it has fantastic action, it makes me appreciate Guardians 2 even more now that we know how these arcs end, it has emotional weight, it has heart and most importantly it delivers a surprising satisfying ending for the conclusion of the character arc. And for these reasons Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 comes in as my number one favorite movie of the year. Like I said, it's been a crazy year for cinema and I think my top and bottom choices show that superhero movies aren't done if you can make them emotional, powerful, well planned out, give them something unique to do rather than just feeling like another superhero movie. And I think it shows how quality has been important to general audiences because movies that are fine are no longer enough to cut it with audiences seeming to care more about quality. Sure, there's a few good movies on here that did flop and I think that's due to the competitiveness of the summer. But when you look at the movies that earned the most money this year, most of them are ones that had really strong critical reception and really good word of mouth and so I think it shows a shift in general audiences that we can no longer just accept the middle of the road or bad movies we want something good we want good quality we want a reason to leave our house to spend a lot of money in the cinema because previously Disney could just pump out a generic superhero movie or the next generic live action remake and people would go but clearly that's not the case anymore we need something special I also want to say thanks to you guys my viewers because the last year was a fantastic year for my channel I saw a massive amount of growth my channel was able to get monetized 
guys. Previously, I only had managed to get a thousand views on shorts and never did it on an actual video. But last year, I managed to get thousands of views on multiple videos. And not only that, some videos got over 10,000 views and even one video getting a ridiculous number of views. So I just wanted to say thanks for a fantastic 2023. Thanks again for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like it if you did. Be sure to subscribe if you're new here to see more videos like this talking about the type of movies that I talked about in this video. But for now, thanks for watching. Cinemaze.